So thank you everybody for coming to this presentation from the CoLab um, team. We are really excited to have Jules Badu. I'm never asked her how to <laughs> say your last name um, to speak on behalf of the folks um, in Prince George. So thank you, Jules, for being here and sorry for butchering your last name. Um, all good. So my name is Jules Budow. Um, I live here in Prince George on the unceded territory of the Clately Tanay. Um, I work, I'm a program manager with Uniting Northern Drug Users, a drug user group here. I'm also a master's student uh, doing research in prescribed safe supply. Um, I've also worked in harm reduction housing on and off for the last eight years, which is relevant to our presentation and also used to manage an overdose prevention site here in Prince George. Um, unfortunately, my colleague Amelia couldn't make it today. She has a work emergency. She might kind of like hop in for a second. Um, I accidentally hit everyone and it's kind of weirding me out because I can't see anyone, but oh, whatever. Okay, so um, a little presentation on the strategies that led and the events that led up to us having the first legally uh, protected encampment in Canada here in Prince George. It gives us a place to make up a home of our own, how community activism led to a legally protected encampment. Um, oops. So uh, just a little uh, outline for the presentation. I'm gonna do a little background on Prince George. Um, <laughs> we, we, Millie and I split this up very nicely, but now she's not here. So I'll talk a little bit about a community group we have here called Together We Stand. I'll talk about the start of Moccasin Flats, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, the on, the court case, which had uh, three different parts to it. Um, a bylaw report that Amelia and I uh, designed, researched, and wrote, and uh, an all-candidates forum on uh, poverty, homelessness, and the drug poisoning crisis that we had here, and a little bit about what we're doing now at Moccasin Flats. So a little background about Prince George. Um, it's a pretty small city. It's 75,000 people. Um, there's only about 150 to 200 visibly unhoused people. It's important to note that our point of town count is taken in the winter. Um, there are less visibly homeless people here in the winter because people are often allowed or can like couch surf a little more, stay with relatives a little more when it's so cold because it often does reach about minus 30. I think it's minus 30 here today or minus 40. It often reaches minus 40 or minus 50 here in the winter. Uh, we have an extremely fluid unhoused population. So we have 54 First Nations here in the north. Um, Prince George is not really in the north. It's actually in the middle of the province and northern the northern health area is like the top half of the province. Um, those 54 First Nations in the north are an important uh, aspect of the population of Prince George because many of the band offices also have offices in Prince George. Um, many of those communities don't even have high schools and so um, people have to come to Prince George to attend high school. Um, Prince George has the only uh, detox services in the north. Um, people are sent here to jail and then released. People have to access uh, things like dial dialysis here in Prince George and so on and so on. And for you Consider the capital of the north, uh, has the highest urban indigenous population in Prince George at, I think, 16 and a half percent compared to, say, like two or three percent in Prince George, in Vancouver or Victoria. Um, and that is reflected in our homeless population. About 80 percent of people in the point of time homeless count are First Nations. Uh, there's a long history of displacement in Prince George. Uh, for instance, uh, the Clately Tanay were moved under the village, which is located right basically where near where I live. Uh, their village was burnt down and pushed into the Fraser River um, by basically the city of Prince George. I think that was in 1911 or 1914. Uh, there was also a village here called Island Cash, uh, which was uh, mostly people who had lost their status for fighting the war. Three people who had moved from the prairies to work in the mills. In the 60s, we had 700 mills here. Um, the city allowed that village to flood and then condemned it and then moved them out. Um, then, of course, resource extraction is extremely important to uh, what goes on in Prince George and the north. Um, 
like that the rural communities are extremely underdeveloped um, and communities are displaced and or basically ruined. Uh, you know, a mine reopened like a mine reversed the flow of the Nichaca River, which uh, basically destroyed all possibility of fishing for a few communities here, so on and so on. Of course, there's a huge history of ignoring concerns of marginalized people. Um, uh, RCMP case of, a case of RCMP officers harassing very young indigenous girls is like resurfacing in the media when it came out in the 90s and 2000s, it was completely ignored. I think that because of that, um, so that history of ignoring the concerns of marginalized people was what threw the city of Prince George off when we fought their injunction of the tent city. They didn't think that anyone would speak on behalf of uh, unhoused people. Uh, we also have the highest per capita homelessness rate in BC in 19. In 2019, it was showed that 1,000, 1 percent of the population experienced homelessness in 2019, like higher than any other area in BC. Uh, from 2020 onward, we also have the highest overdose death rates in Northern Health. Uh, when I moved here in 2019, there was no harm reduction in any shelters or transition homes, uh, which meant that drug users essentially could not stay in any shelters. Um, in 2020, no, 2021, I was managing an overdose prevention site and we used to open at 6 a.m. specifically uh, so that people could pick up their belongings and come inside or else their things would be thrown out by by lot every single morning. This was supposed to be Amelia's slide. So around that time, a uh, Facebook group started called Together We Stand. At first I didn't trust it and then I realized that the people who started it were formerly unhoused people. Um, it was really interesting. It led to a lot of awareness uh, for people in the city who were concerned about like visible homelessness and the homelessness rates in Prince George. And um, people began to understand that how homeless people, unhoused people were and treated was not like a natural consequence of being homelessness. It was like a direct policy of the, the shelters and the city. And the city was, we're going on, we're doing sort of like um, ongoing like campaigns to like make people's lives worse, such as the sweeps. Uh, the city was providing grants for different businesses, including uh, the building that houses the needle exchange. Uh, so it would play extremely loud, repeating opera music over and over and over again, like so loud you can have a conversation. Uh, so it began to like build sort of an alliance of people wanting to change things and like coordinating services and uh, meeting people's needs. I think right now it's about uh, 1,500 people, which in a city of 75K is pretty good. And we're grassroots, there's no funding, there's no leadership structure. Um, so around that time, so I was managing the overdose prevention site. Uh, we were allowing people to get up every morning at 6 a.m. and move their stuff inside. We had bins for people's things. Um, so that it, they wouldn't get swept and taken away by bylaw. Um, around that time, uh, the city also asked us, as if we weren't busy enough, to like make sure that everyone moved off the block. So where I managed an overdose prevention site called Two Doors Down, and beside it was a place called the Fire Pit, which is run by Positive Living North here. And so they have like outreach services and meals there, and then the needle exchange. And people used to just live and camp right on against the building, like around this corner. Um, and the city asked us to move everyone one day um, because they wanted, they said it was a biohazard and they wanted to clean it. So we obliged and helped people move. They moved across the street, they moved to another grassy area. And then the city was like, oh, sorry, we didn't have that machine to clean it. And that sort of began and then everyone moved to this other park, which was like visible on the highway. So people complained about that. Uh, the manager bylaw was trying to declare the place where everyone lived a nuisance property, even though it had like the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? The, the, the foundational services that were keeping people alive. Uh, so in May of 2021, two women, Melanie and Darlene, um, decided to move into this grassy area. Yeah, like right outside of downtown. Uh, Darlene named the camp Moccasin Flats, which is like an on 
a name that has been used for um, other areas where Indigenous people have lived in urban areas and was also the name of a TV show and it was about an, an urban reserve in Regina. I haven't seen that TV show. I should watch it. Um, also around that time, the city uh, was trying enacted a bylaw called the, the Safe Streets Bylaw, uh, which basically um, made made it illegal to do any panhandling after dark, to be near any bank machines, any open drug use, uh, to be blocking any sidewalks, blah, blah, blah. Um, it was actually interesting because, because they passed that bylaw that helped us make moccasin flats legally protected because the bylaw made it basically illegal for people to exist if you didn't have a home in any way. Uh, we tried to fight that bylaw, but it passed. And then after that, uh, the city applied for an injunction to evict the camps. Um, so Amelia, my colleague Amelia was the one who uh, I was very busy doing other things. She heard about the injunction. She wanted to fight it. Um, she was going to do this part of the presentations, but she had a work emergency. So I asked her to send me a message on Facebook Messenger. I said, wait, can you type in here a quick thing about how you find the lawyers? She said, I called a bunch of lawyers, begged. Then Monday morning, the morning that we were going to court, Rez, that's her partner who is the communications manager for um, a few indigenous uh, collaborative groups here in Research. So Rez got the name of the BC First Nations Justice Center and I called Darlene. Uh, it's confusing because the first campers were named Darlene and our Darlene and Melanie and our lawyers were also named Darlene and Melanie, which is a really interesting coincidence. So she said, I got the name of BC First Nations Justice Center. I called Darlene. She answered. It showed up at the court four hours later. Um, Vancouver lawyer, lawyers have me, uh, she doesn't even say I have no idea what that says. Vancouver lawyers have me at paragraphs to say judge, say to judge in worst case scenario. I practice that a paragraph. Uh, so grateful. Darlene said yes. I don't know what that means. So she called some lawyers. The BC First Nations Justice Center said yes, showed up to court, asked for more time for our submissions. Um, and we went from there. Um, so they went to court. Uh, the Here we go. Uh, in October 2022, they went back to court. Uh, the BC Supreme Court, J Justice Hinkson, just declared that moccasin flats can stay. So that was the encampment that's over in the grass er area. Um, there was another encampment that was right sort of like in between some buildings on an empty lot. And that was called the splits because that was a private property. Uh, the judge declared that that one needed to be closed down. and But that moccasin flats could stay because there was an absence of housing and, daytime, and suitable daytime services. Suitable housing, suitable shelter, suitable daytime services. We did not have enough of that. So the judge decided that it could stay. So the splits was closed down. Um, those people were all um, moved into this new hotel that was leased by PC Housing called the Knights Inn. So they were all moved there. Um, there's about 35 open room like rooms that people can live in there. Uh, so there were about 20 people at the splits were moved in. Um, and then on November 17th, uh, some people from Mockham's Flats were moved into the Knights Inn. And then the city began using bobcats to plow the city or to plow the encampment, um, which was like incredibly surprising. That story was broke by the Prince George Citizen because their office could see the bobcats happening. Um, we all rushed down there. The lawyers rushed down there. Um, there was like a lot of conflicts. Like one of the bio officers like tried to hit Amelia and push her camera out of her hand. Um, so because people, some people had moved into the Knights Inn, the city basically said that everybody was housed. And because the Knights Inn was um, allowed people to stay there in the day, in the day, which of course they would because it's housing and not shelters. Um, they declared that they had met the conditions, the Stewart condition, that there was suitable housing and suitable daytime services, and that they were completely in the right to start pl plowing the camp. Um, and then they applied for injunction to retroactively. Um, destroy the camp. Um, 
so what we did at that time was we did a call out for people whose uh, belongings and shelters were destroyed, um, but they were not housed. And we had a drop in session at the fire pit where people could come in and we started collecting affidavits. Um, one person was in jail that day. Uh, one person was in the hospital. It's important to note that they did that on welfare day. So if you're unhoused and it's check day, you need to go down to the office and wait in a really long line to pick up your check. So, and it's a very weird, uh, like it's too much of a coincidence for them to have not planned it on that day, but they claim to have not known. Um, and they believe that they were in their right. And they also said that they had verbal consent to destroy all of those tents that they did. Even the people, so the people, even the people had moved, they went back to get their things and all their things were destroyed. Um, so the, the city then claimed that they had sufficient daytime services in the city. Um, they, they submitted an affidavit that was a handout from the RCMP that just basically listed all these services, including like thrift stores. It was like very confusing. Um, so at that time, I really took over uh, uh, collecting evidence for the case. Um, I went through the list that the RCMP had provided. I called every single service, uh, found out if they actually had drop-in services or not, like places where people could just be inside and just kind of exist, not outside in the winter conditions. Um, a lot of those places actually did have drop-in services. A lot of services were closed down um, when COVID happened and never reopened. We kind of created like a like a chart of everything that was open. There were huge gaps, like every day there was like a few hours in the morning, a few hours in the night, Sunday, stat holidays, where there were places that nobody could be. Um, oh, my slides are out of order because I just made it this morning. Um, Sorry, everyone. Oh, here's some pictures of this is a picture of a bobcat. There used to be a lot of shelters there. Um, our peer and staff member Patrick lived there. Uh, they raised his shelter and done not, did not provide him any housing. Some people were, were are banned from um, all the shelters and housing agencies, so they just couldn't be housed by the people who'd been giving those given those contracts. Uh, the city admitted in a private meeting with Terry TG, the regional chief of the BC Assembly First Nations, that they deliberately plowed someone's tent because he was a criminal. Um, I don't know if they thought someone's a violent criminal, why they would want him roaming the streets instead of like having a secure place to be. There's another picture from that day of the police. Um, so in this in that round of submissions, we really focused on the question of like what counts as suitable. And so during that time, there was a cold snap. Um, I'm gonna look check this chat. Okay, never mind. Uh, the cold snap was really convenient for me working on this case because it provided me uh, a, a place, a central place where I could go and talk to people. Um, so I would just see people in the warming center and offer we were paying people to also through like a together we stand like fund that we had uh for their time doing these affidavits and people also got backlash for these affidavits so it was important to pay them so we would like get some information about them and then we go through all the services um and look at their experiences with them so it'd be like um Oh, I was banned from ASAP because I had harm reduction supplies once. Um, I tried to go there, even in the cold snap, the shelters are supposed to accept everyone. They wouldn't let me in. Um, I'm banned from AWAC or I don't go from go to AWAC because they don't allow me to bring in my blankets and sleeping bags. So then if you get kicked out or the next day you don't get a bed there, then you've lost your things. Um, people have never interacted with housing outreach service. John Howard Society does not actually have drop-in services, so on and so on and so on. Like there are good services in the city that people really like, but it's like sort of like a patchwork network of things around the city. Um, and there just wasn't, a, like there were so many times in the day where people couldn't be inside anywhere, even in like super cold conditions. Um, and people 
there were just so many barriers, like someone would enter second stage housing at one agency, um, but they had to be like abstinent. And then they like went to the hospital uh, for like a bone infection. He was given fentanyl. He was then piss tested at his shelter. He was, it was a Friday night. So he had to leave. Uh, he had to talk to the manager. It was a long weekend. So then he like started using again and like went into the spiral, like a lot of different stories like that. I don't know why it's not going to the next slide. So yeah, in the end, um, the Supreme Court judge, Justice Koval, uh, decided that we were right and that the city uh, really fucked up uh, and that they violated the court order. Um, the final decision was under the Stewart order, the lower Patricia encampment was permitted to stay unless and until the city demonstrated available and accessible housing and daytime facilities for its occupants. The city breached the Stewart order by dismantling much of the encampment without such housing or daytime facilities for many of the occupants. This breach serious this breach inflicted serious harm on vulnerable people. So that's like the one like one takeaway that I hope you all like but I'm trying to emphasize, sorry, guys, I didn't eat this morning. I was like, remember. Uh, so the Stewart order, like, remember that one. Um, I can also, or maybe, I think Brittany has a copy of the uh, final decision. But so the Stewart order is that the city cannot uh, evict encampments unless they demonstrate available and accessible housing in daytime facilities. And, um, in that final decision, he agreed with us that um, being a drug user and not being able to access shelters for that reason counted as a, some place being unsuitable. Also, uh, places not accessible for couples, that was important. Uh, places where people could bring pets, uh, places that were trauma-informed and could deal with people's mental health crisis, crises, these were all really important. And the decision and the final decision also was that uh, the people, people whose belongings were destroyed were allowed, could seek compensation. So that was a big one. Um, important to note that although we had communication with a lot of unhoused people, displaced people, some people in the camp, at the time there were things going on in the camp that we didn't really know. Like when we won the fit, first victory that um, people were allowed to stay in Maka's and flats, but had to move from the splits. And we were like all celebrating. We had like a celebration feast. We we're a little bit unaware of like what was happening actually in the camp. So after that first decision, the city uh, started like a campaign of psychological torture on the campers. They started doing a lot of like using a lot of like really large machinery, like very early in the morning. Um, and like campers started finding like, uh, discarded like pe large pieces of like meat and animals around in the camp and it was like very weird um bc housing had originally uh provided the funding for dumpsters and uh porta potty services in the camp and then they stopped servicing them they became full of human waste um they took away the dumpsters so people had nowhere to put their garbage so the sort of the state of the camp kind of like decompensated and like just like looked bad so that was going on that we kind of didn't really realize until later so i think that's important to know that that was like a mistake that we made we're not perfect um yes, i'm here just so you know i've made it for the last half oh hey <laughs> okay well let me take a break why don't you talk about the bylaw report Cool. Awesome. So, um, hi everyone. Sorry. Um, when I started working with Jules on, uh, together we stand in mocks and flats, I wasn't employed, which really helped me be a great activist. And now that I'm employed, I'm, I'm less good as an activist. So I apologize that I'm coming in late. Um, so the slide in front of you talks a little bit about the bylaw report. Um, so I'm sure uh, Jules has already mentioned that, um, we were able uh, to get Dr. Joseph Hermer from the University of Toronto. He came to um, Prince George and he worked with the BC for uh, Assembly of First Nations um, to address the bylaws that the city was bringing in, the Safe Street bylaws. 
and he had um, he had uh, conducted an amazing uh, report looking at the first 99 days of the impact of the bylaws from a using freedom of information um, data from the bylaw itself. Um, he was going to present that data um, in early March. And at the same time, um, we started to think, well, his data was great, but it didn't show the human side. It didn't show what was actually happening to real human lives as a result of these really punitive bylaws. Um, so a team of researchers came together. Um, we had uh, half of the researchers were Indigenous, half of the researchers were non-Indigenous, half of the researchers had had um, ex firsthand experience living and uh, living on the streets and half of us did not. Uh, we came together and created um, a fairly, I would say a fairly rigorous and rapid uh, rollout of um, a research protocol that looked at how bylaws were impacting people in their daily life. The results of, uh, of the report were shocking and you can find that report in the um, BC Assembly of First Nations. They, they published the report, they commissioned and they published the report. Um, so what we found was that the bylaw made it, you can see for everybody, what, whether it was men, women or First Nations, and we decided in our research that it was important that we, we looked at all people, um, that we looked at um, women, particularly because Prince George has a much higher rate of homelessness among women uh, compared to the rest of the country. And we also wanted to look at particularly First Nations to see how um, the bylaw was affecting First Nations. And we found across the board, it was affecting people's abilities to store their belongings, which of course was related to their security and survival. If they can't keep their warm, warm things, then they're gonna, they're gonna freeze. Um, we saw that um, for women more so, it was affecting their ability to be with family or friends. And we know, you know, our approach was really community is essential to how people survive. Community was an essential element, something that you can't really um, measure so much but, but we know uh, that community is an essential element of survival. And we found that the bylaws were um, significantly affecting the ability of women to be with community. It was segregating and isolating uh, women. It affected um, the, and the other th interesting thing was around women was it was making it even harder for women to, to use safe supply. So Prince George has the highest, one of the highest rates of um, deaths due to uh, toxic drug supply. And um, the bylaw was 100% of women said that it was difficult for them to maintain or keep their harm reduction supplies because of the bylaw. Um, you can see from the rest of the graphs, uh, it made it harder for everyone to conserve their energy, um, to access services, to use drugs safely. Um, and across the board, people were not educated um, in understanding what the safe, safe Street bylaw was about and what it was supposed to do for them. And that was really interesting because our mayor at the time kept saying in, in, in public papers, the bylaw is an educational tool. It's, it's there to teach people how they should behave in public, essentially. Um, but less than 30% of people understood what the bylaws were about. So the, the, the approach to educate was very poor. And in fact, Joe later was able to, to demonstrate that um, in his Freedom of Information report. Um, that there were no attempts to really educate people about the bylaws. As a result of um, the, the this report, um, as well as Joe Hermer's report, the city did make an apology for causing harm to citizens. Um, they read the report, they were like, <laughs> there was no way of getting around it. And um, it also led uh, to them dropping their third potential case uh, they wanted to, to uh, take Moccasin Flats back to court. And as a result of these two reports, they decided to drop the case. They knew there was no way they were going to win this one. So, um, no, yeah, you, you, you do one more slide. Okay, perfect. Um, so um, in the spring, uh, so you'll recall... So it was November 17th was the destruction of Moccasin Flats. The city uses the term the disposal, but November 17th was the destruction of Moccasin Flats. March 24th was when the city uh, decided to drop the case. The snow started to melt. Um, and so uh, citizens, both those who were living in Moccasin Flats, those, were, those who were living in supportive shelters and those who were housed, we came together in April 
um, to do a cleanup. When the snow was starting to melt, it was possible for us to like do a cleanup and to do a look around. So I think we had about 25 people. We were able to, um, to get a, a dumpster. Um, somebody paid for the dumpster uh, so we could uh, put all, all the rubbish and the decay because it was you know under, under snow. Um, but it was uh, when we were doing the cleanup, we found a number of things that were um, of sentimental value that were meaningful or useful for survival, including a birth certificate. So all that to say, like the 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 disposal, as the city called it, was not um, a free, fair and informed consent process, because why would people leave their birth certificates um, lying around if this was a free fair and prior informed um, process. Yeah, so I really think that speaks to how much the city just didn't anticipate that anyone would like look at what they were doing and dispute it or like that anyone would care like what a daytime facility was or like what a shelter is or like actually like look at the times. Um, and I think that that is a way that like really systematically like breaking down their arguments and like using like real life testimony yeah. and like ha people having like allies with the resources, uh, looking to the people that they're supporting and like taking their guidance, but like taking their like abilities and resources to like form that argument, form a movement and argue against the city and using these already like entrenched human rights. And then also like, working with so we had like the bc assembly of first nations uh publishing our report and then like the support of like joe harmer like the support of academia support of like different organizations but like taking the guidance and like the viewpoint of the people actually impacted impacted is like the super important part whenever i try to change the slide it's just like oh there we go um and I think that really created a voice and like people really started to think that this was super significant, a really fucking cool thing that we did in the fall um, ahead of our municipal election is that we organized our, our own forum. Um, I just started a coalition like very quickly and you could do it. You just rent out a space and you say we're having a candidate an all candidates forum and you invite the candidates. And like, I think, we have a lot. Of, we had a lot of candidates here for such a small city. I think it was like twenty six for like one or two. I think. I think two or three people didn't show up, and one was sick. We don't know what happened to one. Um, I think two people sent sent their regrets, and like so. One thing we did was that like we really focused on like their past. One, like what they were arguing for. Two, did they even understand? Like a lot of the mayors were like, oh, we should shut down the needle exchange because they don't exchange needles. Like, like just really like pressing them on like what they're saying, um, how little they understand. And um, yeah, tearing apart their arguments basically. And just like, like it's just like a unified voice. Um, another thing we did was that we had funding for community engagement, I think from the, um, like undo did through the First Nations Health Authority. So we were able to pay 30 peers uh, $20 for their uh, engagement. We had we gave them all seats in the front, uh, we fed them, we gave them little sheets and they were able to like fill out all their feedback on all, on all the candidates. And we had them in the front, the candidates had to look at them, being talk to them about like what their policies are and like how they're they're talking about and de de dehumanizing like look them in their eyes and explain like why they need to shut down the needle exchange why they believe in like forced treatment or how they're conflating like like poverty and homelessness and and addiction and it was extremely well attended it was like standing room only very packed and yeah that's a thing you can do <laughs> As long as as long as you're not paying for advertising, which makes you um, I don't remember the legal term, but basically you don't need to register as like a third party, like electoral party in the elections process. If you're not paying for an, any advertising, if you're not um, putting up any any billboard billboards, like you're allowed to make a Facebook page and make posts and make Instagram posts, put it on Twitter as long as you're not paying for it. It's fine. 
I wasn't, I, I'm, I'm going to say I didn't organize that event. I had nothing to do with the organization of that event. It was, I think the highlight of my life, like being in this room, um, <laughs> it, it, it was incredible because it did sway the way um, council and our new mayor have behaved in this new term. I really believe that the questions that were asked, they were very well researched questions about specific candidates and they had to answer specific questions that were important to our cause. Um, and the accountability that has come from, from that, I believe has actually changed how um, the claims process is happening from the November 17th destruction. It's happened how the mayor and council are debating around um, uh, around homelessness. It was phenomenal. So if there's anything you guys take away, I would say that that event was changed, it changed the trajectory here. Yeah, another thing that happened in the election was that um, another ally of ours, Julian, figured out how the process of how people could vote without ID and without homes. And he made a little she instructional sheet, like went to different agencies, found out who could like create like letters of identity, um, campaigned at the tent cities, told people how to vote. Uh, one of our member, an undue member named Florence, who recently passed away, provided post voter support on that day. Uh, like on the main election day. So she would go in with people without ID and homes and just make sure that they were treated right, vouch for their identity, even though there wasn't really a municipal vouching uh, system, but like provided support. Um, in the end, like basically all the council were incumbent, incumbent, but there is definitely like a shift in how um, they do address this and how they're, like even their like language and tone and it's also really funny because it's like all incumbent com uh counselors and then like a new mayor with literally no actual political experience but he campaigned on the idea that he was going to end homelessness and like even if and like the other day i had a meet he was in moccasin flats i had a meeting with him and he talked about like what needs to be done and like even if things don't happen as much as he promises. We knew the other candidates had were already full of shit, so and we gave them a chance. So um, here we go. And so right now, what's happening in Moccasin Flats? Um, so undo. We have a wellness trailer there. Um, it's very low funded. Um, there's a little bit of, of disconnect between the mayor and council and the city staff. The city staff has uh, told BC Hydro that we absolutely cannot be hooked up to the power line so basically we pay 60 to 100 dollars in gas every day rather than five dollars of electricity which is very bullshit um and because of that we are all paid very little and also rely on volunteer hours and people doing their community service hours uh staffing our trailer um so we are open 24 hours a day it's the only 24-hour drop-in in the city um People can come in, uh, access harm reduction supplies, uh, just warm up, charge their phones, um, maybe like use a phone. Uh, sometimes we have snacks, we have coffee. Uh, and it's also a place now so the Together We Stand movement has like has continued and like a lot of the connections that we made have remained. So like um, people will come like, you know, to, this morning I dropped off a staff off. I'm kind of like, I'm a coordinator there. And they're like, oh, we all, we're all out of cups because someone dropped off hot soup. So they had to use all the cups for the soup. So it's like, great. But then now I'm like, fuck, I gotta get cups. Um, but you know, it's like a, it's like a hub for like people, things to be like dropped off and like people, things can like stay warm. And we, we do have power and that's amazing. And also other um, service providers have connected to us. So people who are, you know, the Prince George Native Friendship Center, um, they have they send wellness workers in every Friday. They can connect people with treatment, do treatment referrals, grief counseling, smart recovery, well variety, things like that. Um, we had, maybe I have this in the next slide. Oops. Oh, you guys want to watch Come a little YouTube me video? I mean. Warming trailer. <laughs> Our steps were stolen. Donations of clothes and period products. Harm reduction supplies. Friendly staff and more first. There you go. So we recently had a healing fire. We, uh, the Psychist Nation, 
uh, which is a First Nations community about an hour away from here, just south of Vanderhoof. Uh, they have a, they're one of the nations that was basically uh, their livelihood was destroyed by the uh, Rio Tinto destroying of the Nechaco River. Um, they have a lot of members uh, who are un unhoused in Prince George, and they've lost a lot of members to the overdose crisis in the past few years. So they coordinated something called a healing fire. Uh, they tried to get all the chiefs of all the nations to come down, but unfortunately there was a blizzard that day, so the road conditions in the north were terrible. That's the nature of living in the north. Um, but it was really amazing. Um, there were a lot of people there. The mayor came, the mayor spoke. Um, the Psychos Nation was handing out packs of cigarettes, which I thought was really great to like, just give people like what they need and want. There were a lot of other donations and food given out. Um, one extremely cool thing was that um, they brought four port porta parties on site for the event and um, we basically begged them to leave two of them. So now we have porta potties they paid for the maintenance maintenance of them for several weeks and then we had funding so we were able to take care of that um be, they're right beside our trailer so we have our staff just sort of like look over them make sure they aren't getting destroyed um yeah but, and so right now we have a claims process for those people people who lost their belongings on november 17th but uh we can't really talk about it much because for I will say a little bit. So we, um, and, and this is where I've seen such a change from the old mayor to the new mayor. So after the city made their public apology, we said, okay, so your public apology counts for what? You need to do something for people. So after several months of negotiating, they did direct us to the claims process, which is on the city of Prince George. So if, for instance, they're like putting in a hydrometer and they knock something off in your house, then there's a claims process so you can get that fixed. So they directed us to that process. We um, created a protocol again, and it's all laid out. So if you if you want the protocol, I'm happy to send the protocol to you uh, where we brought people in. And um, we had a couple of day events where people could, they had to list um, what they lost, what the impact of their loss was um, and how they, you know, how much it costs essentially. And this was all negotiated with the city. Um, we were able to uh, get about uh, 35. Okay, I'll send um, Nikki, I'll send it over to um, I've got Brittany's email address. I'll send it to Brittany and, and she can pass it along. Um, we then submitted it to the city in like this massive binder with each person annotated. Um, and it is taking a while, but the city has totally changed tune, and I believe that they are ready to settle with us. I got married on the married um, on the weekend, and so now that that's done, I can focus again on getting the claims settled. And I believe that within the next couple of weeks, we'll be able to get the first couple of claimants um, registered. We have agreed to the city that we would do this in with no me, and this is why we're being a little bit subtle. Um, we because we said this is about building trust. You guys did damage, and we're going to work in good faith that you can make your apology good, and we want to build trust. We don't want to shame you. We want to we want to make good on the apology. So we said we're not going to do any media around this. We're not going to write any reports around this. We will do this as citizens together. And the city, as they've seen that we are not going to the media, they they they've extended their arm as well. And um, yeah, it's been a it's it's actually been a um, a bit of a redeeming process. You know, hopefully in a couple of weeks I'll be able to say, yeah, people got money for it. And there's different levels of claimants. You know, one person lost, as I'm sure Jules told you, um, she lost the ashes of her mother. So how do you recover that? You know, there's no amount of money to recover the ashes of your mother. You know, some people lost an iPad. We can recover an iPad, no problem. Um, but yeah, there has been a, a fairly rigorous process around this. Right. So we should wrap it up. So I'm going to say the takeaway is uh, build alliances in your community, uh, center the voices of the people impacted, uh, collaborate with Indigenous organizations. Remember the Stewart condition to be suitable shelter and daytime facilities. So places for people to be 24 hours a day. Um, you can do your own candidates forum and um, yeah. I would say another one is like no ego, like a lot of uh, a lot of organizations like it's just been incredible in Prince George. I come from Toronto. There's lots of ego around this movement in Toronto. I will be honest, like lots of theory, philosophies, blah, blah, blah. 
Um, what's been a really amazing to move stuff in Prince George is like people are decentering themselves and we're coming at it as a community. It's not about any one ego.